Hi, Torah fans out there. This is Ray, the singing Talit. Uh, and as usual over the last few weeks... Oh, oh, thank you for asking. Yes, I am feeling better. Thank you. Um, but as, uh, as we've been experiencing over the last few weeks, um, we do have some foster children in the house, and I'm having to do these readings during their nap time. So we may suddenly and abruptly be cut off. Uh, and if that's the case, we'll, uh, we'll pick it up as part two later. Let's get right into it. We're reading in Exodus. This is the time of... The best way to think of Exodus is this is the time when um, the children of Israel have left Egypt and are now in the wilderness and receiving instruction from Yehovah on what he expects of them as his people. Uh, we have not yet seen the golden calf, but it is coming. Um, we have, there we go, Tony, and chapter 30, Exodus chapter 30. And you shall make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood you shall you make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, from this to cubit, from there to there, that's a cubit. <clears throat> the breadth thereof, four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof, and the horns thereof shall be of the same. And you shall overlay it with pure gold in the top thereof, and you shall make it a crown of gold round about, and two golden rings shall you make in it under the corner of which by the two corners thereof upon the two sides of it shall you make it, and they shall be four places for staves to bear it withal. And you shall make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put it before the veil that it is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where it will me where I will meet with you and Aaron shall burn their own sweet incense every morning when he has dressed the lamps he shall burn incense upon it and when Aharon lighteth the lamps at evening he shall burn incense upon it a perpetual incense before Jehovah throughout your generations you shall offer no strange incense thereof, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering upon it. And Aharon shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offerings of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is, a, it is most holy unto Jehovah. And Jehovah spake unto Moshe, When you will take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto Jehovah. When you number them, that there be no plague among them, and when you number them, this they shall give every one that passeth among them are numbered, a half shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty geras, and half a shekel shall be the offering. Well, I actually started reading a little early. Uh, the Torah portion actually starts in Exodus 30, 11, um, which is beginning the collection of the half shekel. Uh, this half shekel uh, was reinstituted by the Pharisees in about 70 B.C. Um, in coordination with a uh, Greek queen who they uh, basically um, asked to have the half shekel tax become a uh, enforced tax on all Jews at law. Uh, anywhere that, the, that that particular Greek ruler had, an, had authority, which was not everywhere, but Jews all over the, the diaspora were sending um, at least that half shekel typically in for the temple. And in fact, when Yeshua was with Peter and they came to him and says, does your master pay the, pay the tax? Those were not Roman tax collectors. Those were temple tax collectors. And he said, oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, he went to Yeshua and Yeshua said to him, well, let me ask you this. Does a king ask his sons to pay taxes or does he ask those who are strangers in the land to pay tax when they come in? And they said, well, the tax is for strangers. And he's like, that's right. But since... We don't want to cause any trouble. Fish up a fish and the two drachma will be in his mouth to pay that tax. Because that's a, that, that was the half shekel tax that had been enforced by the Pharisees. And you can read about that in Alfred Edersheim's um, The Temple and Its Ministries. Excellent book. Really easy to read too. Let's continue. Uh, Exodus chapter 30 verse 14. Everyone that pass among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto Jehovah. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than a half a shekel. And when they give an offering unto Jehovah to make an atonement for your souls, and you shall take the, the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before Jehovah to make an atonement for your souls. And Jehovah spake unto Moshe, saying, 
you shall also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And you shall put it between the tabernacle congregation, and you shall put water in it therein. For Aharon and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet therein. And when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash it with water, that they do not die when they come near to the altar and to minister to the burnt offering made by fire unto Jehovah. And they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to them and to the seed throughout the generations. And from what I understand, they actually kept the um, water that was made from the burnt, the ashes of the red heifer, or burning of red heifer ashes, that was the water that was kept in the labor of washing at the time. And by the way, that is, that is the recipe for making antibacterial soap. So when you render fat in a fire and you collect the ashes, then you have created a lye. And then when you add that together with um, the other ingredients that are mentioned, for instance, hyssop. Hyssop contains thymol, which has anti, uh, antiseptic properties. Um, they would have added, uh, for, the, for the color red, uh, certain bug shells. And uh, it would have created this um, reddish uh, liquid soap, basically, is what they were making. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. Um, and that's something to remember for later. Um, there is a test of the, uh, what is it, the jealous husband or a virtuous woman, something like that, where uh, I think it's the test of jealousy. So it's the test of the bitter water. So um, when they go to the priest and they do this test of the bitter water, it's going to be very important that the priest and the uh, the high priest and the other priests who have come in into the, to the holy place have been keeping the washing of their feet as is appropriate because one of the parts of that ritual is they must take dust from the floor of the the temple and add it into this mixture um, that is being fed to this woman that she has to eat. Um, and if you got dirty feet, you got a lot of yeast on your feet. So. <coughs> Moreover, Jehovah has spoken to Moses, saying, Take you also of the, the principal spices, the pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and sweet cinnamon, half as much so, and even 250 shekels, of a sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of kasi, 500 shekels, after the shekel of a sanctuary, and the olive oil, a hen, and you shall make it an oil of atonement, or sorry, an oil of anointment, an anointment compound after the art of the apothecary, and it shall be a holy anointing. And you shall anoint the tabernacle of the congregation thereof and the ark of the testimony. And the table and all the vessels and the candlestick and the vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burning and offering of all vessels and the labor and to his foot. And you shall sanctify them that they must be holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. And you shall anoint Aharon and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priestly office. And this is where you'll, you'll see sometimes in the church um, some people get real happy about anointing oil and they want to come and anoint your entire house with anointing oil and that this is where that, that comes from the idea of um, sanctifying these objects that are used for holy purposes and um, that's why that there may be some you know good to come out of letting someone come and anoint your house if you intend to use your house for holy purposes and hopefully you will and you shall speak unto the children of Israel saying this shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations Upon man's flesh shall it be not poured, neither shall you make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. And so unfortunately, now we have an instruction immediately following that that says you're not to use it anywhere else. <laughs> so maybe it's not such a good idea to let someone come rub anointing oil all over your house. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Take unto you sweet spices, staket, onke, and galbanum, and these spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be a like weight, and that you shall make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy, and you shall beat some of it in very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle congregation, where I will meet with you, and, I sh and it shall be upon you most holy. And as for the perfume which you shall make, you shall make it not to yourselves according to the composition thereof, it shall be unto you holy for Jehovah, wheresoever shall make, whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereof, shall even be cut off from his people. So he says, literally, you may not use my recipe for anointing oil as a perfume. Do not do that. That is one of the many things that has been forbidden. 
and we certainly have quite a laundry list of things that we are forbidden to to use certain things for. So for those folks who like to anoint the, take anointing oil and rub their house down and everything else, well, I mean, technically speaking, you don't have the anointing oil that was used then. And if you did have the anointing oil that was used then, then you are forbidden to use it in other ways. So uh, it, it may be more of a, uh, a hopeful gesture than an actual um, effective ritual, you know, in, in that sense. And again, I'm not a, I'm not judging anybody who wants to. Uh, if, if you're doing what you're doing because you want to please the Lord, awesome. Um, but if you really want to please him, then learn his word and what he has instructed. And then sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll be in your life and you'll look back and you'll say, why did I do those crazy things? And it was because you were walking a path and it was steadily becoming narrower. And that's okay. As long as you keep walking the path, you know, just don't, don't give up, don't quit. Keep on walking. All right, Exodus chapter 31. And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, See, I have called by my name Bezael, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of Elohim, and wisdom, and understanding, and knowledge, and all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold, and in silver, and brass, and in the cutting of stones, and to set them in the carvings of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, have given unto Ahobilah, the son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded you. And the tabernacle congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereof, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all of its furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of the burnt offering with his furniture, and the labor of his foot, and then the cause of the sacrifice. And the holy garments of Aharon the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. And the anointing oil and the sweet incense of the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, so shall you do, or so shall they do. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak you also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, <laughs> verily, in other words, truthfully, in other words, there's no change in this one, um, my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Um, for it is a sign between you and me throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who doth sanctify you. So there's your, there's your Sabbath commandment made very clear. If you want the mark upon you, well, that's the mark. You keep the Sabbath and he'll know, you'll know who you are and he'll know who you are. And everybody else will know who you are too because you'll be that one that they can't get to come to work on the weekend You'll be that one that they can't get to come do something they want them to do, you know, when they want to do it. You'll be the one that says, oh, I can't go, man, I need to stay home. I can't come party on Saturday with you, et cetera, et cetera. They'll, they'll, know, that, they'll know who you are and why you're doing it. You should keep the Sabbath thereof, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Ugh. That's a death penalty, huh? Surely be put to death. Surely be put to death. I'm just repeating that. For whosoever do any work therein, that shell shall be cut off from among his people. And of course that word work has many, 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 many understood meanings. And I do mean many. And I'm not just talking, I'm talking about among different Jewish sects who actually were raised up speaking Hebrew. Because that word that, that we translate in English as work doesn't necessarily mean that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but on the seventh, that's the Sabbath of rest, holy to Jehovah, whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And in the six days that the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and it was refreshed, and he gave unto Moshe, when he had had made an end of communing with him upon the Mount of Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of Jehovah. So here we see the receiving of the, the Ten Commandments that were written with the finger of God. Okay, we're going we're gonna to see those, um, what happens to those shortly. Um, but recall that it says here that he worked six days and on the seventh he rested. He didn't say, I waited till the new moon was, by the way, the moon was created on the fourth day of creation. He didn't say, I waited till the moon was in the proper phase and then I counted seven days and then I rested. For you lunar Sabbath keepers out there, he said he worked six days he rested on the seventh the moon itself was not created till the fourth of those days 
for him to have rested from the lunar Sabbath would have required that he wait seven days from the fourth day, which would make it the eleventh day of creation, which it does not seem to be what the scripture said. So, all right, in chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down off the mountain, the people gathered themselves together in Aram and said uh, to him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moshe the man that has brought us out of the land of Egypt, we will not become as is become of him. So they literally thought he went up there and was just never going to come back down. Because, you know, the, the consuming fire that is Jehovah had consumed him, you know, and destroyed him. Um, and apparently since, well, I mean, Aaron didn't get to go up there with him. I think only Joshua came along with him. Um, Aaron had to wait in the outside area as well. Uh, so apparently he didn't know exactly what had happened to Moses either. So maybe that's why he agreed to do it. Or maybe he was just afraid of the people. Or maybe he felt that he was, as high priest, he had been anointed high priest, maybe he felt that he was capable of making that decision. Like that he's high priest, he ought to be able to do what he feels is appropriate concerning worshiping Yehovah in an appropriate way. Because he forget this isn't about worshiping, this is about a marriage that's taking place. This isn't about um, some, this isn't about the, uh, the Bali. This isn't about Bali, this is about Ishi, and there's a um, prophecy that says, you shall no longer call me um, Bali, but you will call me Ishi, which is the difference between calling someone Lord or Master and calling someone Husband or the husbandman, uh, which is something that Yeshua refers to. He says, you know, I want you to be, to eventually become my friends. You know, not just be, not just be the servant, but be my friend. You know, that's the, that's the idea when you become a slave in someone's house that you go from being a servant who just does what they're told to being somebody who's let in on what the master's business is. And then eventually, if you want to, you become a part of his family and accept him as kind of your foster father. And you say, hey, you know, pierce my ear to your doorpost because I'm I don't ever want to leave your home. I want to be a part of your home forever. You know, that's the idea, is that you would move from being um, simply saying, "Oh, I will worship this mighty God," to saying, "No, no, I am one with this mighty God. I am, I am His, you know, His living vessel that He is using. I'm no longer a uh, person on the outside offering up a trade and gifts to try to get something. I'm a person who says, I give up on who I am, and I only want what you want for me." Um, and that was a new concept at the time. Heck, it's a new concept for most people now. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize that that's, that's the whole purpose, is that you will suffer a death. You will die. That's the point of going through tribulation or the, the narrowing path, is that it steadily gets to where there's no wiggle room left or right until you're just sliding right down the path, and you don't get to make any decisions anymore. There's no more path. There's no more left or right. There's nowhere to waver to. The path has become so narrow that you simply walk the same thing constantly. It's like walking a tightrope. All right, let's see. Chapter 32. We're talking about the preparations here for the making of the golden calf. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them to me. And I'd like to point out that an earring is a symbol of slavery. Remember, I want to be a part of your household, so pierce my ear to the door, put a hole in my ear, and of course, to keep the hole from sealing back up, you got to put something in it. So, the, obviously, an earring is what you would put into that. All right, so bring those symbols of your slavery to me, right? And all people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them into Aharon, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, and they said, These be your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now I wonder why they said they said as opposed to he said. So was it not simply Aaron that had decided this? Is that the point? All right. And when Aharon saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aharon made proclamation and said, this is Aaron's words, Tomorrow is a feast to Yehovah. So Aaron declared and created a feast. Something that was not um, within his purview to do. At least not as we understand it now. Even though, hey, nobody uh, minds creating their own feasts. A.K.A. Christmas and Easter and such. To uh, celebrate 
Yehovah in the manner in which they prefer to celebrate him. All right. And the Lord said unto Moshe, Go get down from, from your people which you have brought out of the land of Egypt, and they have corrupted themselves. So immediately, oh, sorry, I'm, I, skipped a, I skipped a verse here, and I've got to end this shortly. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So they had a feast the next day. And Jehovah said, Moses, go get you down for, for your people, which you brought, which you brought, notice he says, which you brought from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves, and they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. And they have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have made sacrifice unto it, and have said, These be your gods, O Israel, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Jehovah said unto, these, said unto Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make, and I will make a you a great nation. So this is a little bit of that high drama. This is some of that um, uh, soap opera. Uh, style high drama here because we see Yehovah's like look you, you, I, I, my feelings are hurt step back and stay out my way I'm gonna kill them all I'm gonna kill her I'm gonna kill her I'm gonna kill her for what she's done she's gonna be dead and I'm gonna make a new people out of you Moses and I will marry those people and uh, and of course this is where Moses put the brakes on all that and um, the Lord said <clears throat> excuse me and Moses besought Yehovah his Elohim and said, Yehovah, why do you wrath why does your wrath wax hot against your people, which you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? See now he handed it right back to him and said, Yehovah's like, Moses, you brought these people out of Egypt. Moses like, uh, you brought these people out of Egypt. Uh, you made that clear repeatedly and said, Don't you ever forget, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt and set you free from slavery, right? So he's having a conversation like a friend. He's talking to Jehovah like a friend. Imagine this is the best man and a man on their wedding day. And the, the man on his wedding day is like, she's in the other room right now getting naked for another man. And Moses is like, number one, there ain't no other men but you, gods, that is. And uh, number two, number two is you brought her out. She's yours to deal with. You need to, you need to, you need to act in a respectful and honorable way. You need, to show people how, you need to show this world what an honorable and credible God you are. And how you can deal with these kind of things. So Moses besought him and said, "Didn't you bring it out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Wherefore, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the earth, and turn from turn from that your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people?" So Moses is like, "Listen, if you if you do what you're talking about doing, all of the world will hear of the God of the Israelites." who took an entire people out of slavery in Egypt just to go kill them in the wilderness. Who would ever want you as a god if you did that? Who would ever be able to hold you in the respect and the glory that you are deserving of? If you do? I mean, literally, this is like a conversation between two men. This is not a conversation uh, that's some kind of, you know, I am God from my throne, I have proclaimed. No, none of that stuff. This is, this is a man having a conversation with another man and saying to him, You've got to be the best possible version of who you are in the eyes of everybody watching because everybody's watching. You've got to be the right one. You've got to be the big man here. And remember, remember Abraham. Remember what you said to Abraham and Isaac and to Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own name that you said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken, I will give unto your seed that they shall inherit it forever. And Jehovah repented of the evil which he had thought to do unto his people. So, I mean, literally, Moses calmed him down. Two, three verses, Moses has basically calmed him down. Because the first thing Jehovah says is, step out my way, I'm a killer. I'm a killer. I'm a killer, which I'm a killer, and there ain't going to be no problem no more. I'm a killer. I'm going to make me a new wife out of you, Moses, because I love you. I, I, know you, I know you're solid. And he's like, come on. Come on, man. Ain't nobody solid. Nobody's solid. That's the problem with a lot of folks these days. That's the problem with a lot of folks these days when they're talking about marriage. Um, everybody wants the other person to be perfect because they have a, con I guess, because people conceive of themselves as being perfect. I can tell you I ain't perfect. And uh, my spouse, in my eyes, is perfect, 
But she's not really perfect, but she's perfect in my eyes. Because I understand that she's just as human as I am. And I'm just as human as she is. And that's that's the thing about this conversation we're seeing here between between Moses and, and Yehovah is Yehovah, who actually is perfect, who has the capacity to be, is marrying a bride who is not perfect. And uh, Moses is like, look, you, you, and you see Yehovah act out. He's like, I'm going to act out. I'm going to kill her like I'm going to kill her like any man would kill her. I'm going to kill her for what she did to me. She won't break, like, gonna break my heart on the wedding night. I'm going to kill her. And that cannot happen. And that's why his friend Moses comes to him and says, man, that, that, that can't happen. We have got to be, we got to be next level. We got to be, we, we want to be the people of the Elohim who is beyond the shortcomings of men. We want to be married to the Elohim who actually is true and righteous and just and perfect. We want to be the one who, when the Egyptians say, those Jews left us, why didn't we go with them? God, I wish we'd have just went with them. If I'd have just left with them, I wouldn't have all these problems. That's, that's the kind of conversation we're seeing here. So let's read on. And Moshe turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of stones were in his hand, and the tables were written both from the sides on one side and on the other. They were written, and the tables were the work of Elohim, and the writing was the writing of Elohim graven upon the tables. So this is the writing of the finger of God, right? And, you know, people say Yeshua wrote, Yeshua, Yeshua wrote in the sand with his finger. So you can imagine that if he's writing with his finger, he's probably writing what words were written by God with his finger, right? <clears throat> and when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, and he said unto Moshe, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is them the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. He's like, it's, I don't, it doesn't sound like they're fighting someone. It sounds like they're singing about a victory that they've just won. And it came to pass as soon as it came nigh upon the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moshe's anger wagged. Now, Mo, now it's him, now it's Moshe getting angry. Now it ain't Yehovah's anger. It's, Moshe's done calmed down Yehovah. He done calmed him down. Now Moshe's coming down the mountain. And now he's angry because he's seeing it with his own eyes. Now he understands why Yehovah, who could see what was happening, was so angry. And, um, and Moshe's anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables from his hands and he broke them beneath the mount. And he took, and he, I mean, he went all the way down there to where that calf was. And he took the calf which they had made and he burnt it in fire, ground it into powder, and strawed it into water and made the children of Israel drink it. Now that's a weird statement. How do you burn molten gold into a powder? What is this powder that you make from gold? Because when you melt gold, it's a metal and it stays a metal, unless you know something secret. And this is where the, the question of his Egyptian alchemical knowledge comes in. Uh, did he know how to turn gold? There's a substance called um, mononuclear gold, which um, some people actually sell now which is literally a single atoms of gold mixed into a solution. That's the that's what it's supposed to be anyways. I don't know if that's true or not. But it's speculated that that's what he did. He rendered this golden thing into a powder that could be mixed with water and then drank. Because let's face it, you can't you can't grind gold into dust. I mean, people be like, "Well, what about gold dust? That's what you collect from the earth." Well, yes, when it when I guess if you mix it into stone and ran it through a volcano, you might be able to get it out that way, but uh, he knew something about working with gold that we don't know today. And Moshe said unto Aaron, What did this people, what did this people unto you that, well, this is a odd statement. And Moshe said unto Aaron, What did this people unto you, notice, what did they do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? He's like, well, Did someone try to kill you? Why are you trying to get us all killed? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Okay, and he's talking about Aaron, or Aaron's talking to Moses in this, this case. Um, you know the people, and that they are set to mischief. Hmm. For they said unto me, make us gods, which shall go before us. And as for Moses, and as for this Moses, the man that has gone up and out of the land of Egypt, we want not to become of him. We know we 
Wot not what is become of him. And I say, we don't know what's even happened to him. Has he been consumed? Is he destroyed? Where's our leader, right? And I said unto them, whosoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they give it to me. Then I cast it into the fire. And their same came out, he said, and their same came out this calf. It's like, and this calf just appeared in the flames and in the golden fire. <laughs> yeah, he made that. It didn't appear. Um, and when Moshe saw that, the people were naked. He's like, and they were naked. <coughs> For Aharon had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. And Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Jehovah's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together themselves. So remember, this is, this, uh, this is the tribe that Moses is from. The tribe of Levi is Moses' tribe. And remember now, Levi was the one who had, had been the murderer, right? Levi is the one who had gone, Simeon and Levi had killed the whole town uh, where Dinah um, had taken a husband or a, a man had taken Dinah to be his wife. And uh, he said, that's fine, y'all need to circumcise yourself. And they came in and murdered them all. Um, and he said unto them, thus says Jehovah Elohim of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from the gate throughout the camp. And slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and they fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So that's really not even, that's not even one person from, that's not even one man from the tribe of Levi killing one man. And that's really not that many. Um, that means, let's just say that every, every man that killed killed one man, only killed 3,000 men that day. For Moshe had said, Consecrate yourselves today to Yehovah, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon him a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moshe said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up unto Yehovah. Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. So he's like, I'm going to go back up and talk to the man, and I'm going to try to make this thing right that you have done. And Moshe returned unto Jehovah and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, then blot me, I pray, out of the book which you have written. So here Moses, Moses putting putting his life on the line for him. He's like, look, I know what they did. I saw what they did. I went down there and talked to him about it. Had 3,000 of them killed for it. Didn't kill Aaron, by the way. But killed 3,000 men for it. Um, I understand if you continue to not want to be with her. Uh, but if you don't want her, then you need to go ahead and kill me too. That's uh, that's putting it all on the line for, for the people you love. That's, uh, that's why Moses is the most humble man. Because he did not love his own life unto death. He was willing to accept death rather than love his own life. Because he loved his people. And because he loved Jehovah. Because he knew. If Jehovah continued on that path, everybody in Egypt was just going to call him the God that freed the people so he could murder him in the wilderness. And Jehovah said unto Moshe, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people into the place which I have spoken unto you. Behold, my, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And Jehovah plagued the people because they had made the calf, which Aaron had made. So there was a, a, a price to pay, needless to say. And on that... Um, I'm going to stop the reading for now and come back and do a part two later and pick up from chapter 33. Um, it's kind of a long one, and the kids are getting up from their nap, so i got to go and take care of them. Um, we're going to continue Exodus 33, 34, 1 Kings 18, 20, 18, verse 20, and we'll read from 2 Corinthians in the New Testament too. But that will probably be later tonight. So thank you so much. Baruch Abba, Yehovah. Um, Blessed be the name of Jehovah, and uh, please continue to uh, empty out yourself 
and to fill yourself with what the what he wants for you um, let your life become uh, a living sacrifice made to him um, embrace the idea that you are going to have to die so that he can live within you and if you will do that 